I'd like to just contextualize a little bit our vision for the webinar space this year. Um, and myself and Cherise Yun will be hosting either jointly or alternating the conservation webinars during the course of the year. Um, from my side, you, you may not know or you may know, but I was appointed last year in September. And um, before my time with the Botanical Society, I was very involved in doing research on the Proteaceae family mostly based at Stellenbosch University. Um, and it's often tricky to sort of highlight one topic or aspect that one would be um, passionate about. But I think in the broadest sense, I'm curious about the lives of plants um, and especially through studying them in a demographic and um, looking at their trait adaptations in different environments that they occur in. Um, there will be a bit more about this later, and we can definitely also, you know, dedicate a bit more time to it. But today is um, less about me and more about the national conservation team that I'll introduce to you shortly. Um, Cherise Fulhoun, many of you know her as um, also hosting the webinars during the course of last year towards the end. And uh, Cherise is really passionate about growing both plants and people um, and she brings with her a wealth of experience in botanical horticulture. And she's served um, or been involved with the Kirstenbosch Botanical Garden in particular for more than 20 years. Um, just a brief background, just to know where I come from. Um, yes, I worked on charismatic um, species, mostly the protea. And um, when I said in my earlier slide that we look at plants or we looked at plants through a demographic or trait lens, um, we really did take a close look at their seeds. And what you're seeing in the um, sort of depiction here in the slide is we opened up the cones and um, basically counted the amount of fertile seeds that would be in a plant's um, canopy. And this is particularly a method that one can use with um, what we call serotonous proteaceae. So they have a really strong link to fire, a fire-driven life cycle. Um, and these seeds, because many of the plants are actually killed by fire, um, this is really the currency that determines their long-term survival in the environment um, and also allows them to regenerate after fire. One of my most exciting projects that I worked on last year was um, actually in a greenhouse where after we collected all the seeds, we germinated um, the seeds in, in a more controlled environment. And um, yeah, in the end, we sat with about nine and a half thousand seedlings of the 18 protea species. Um, so I've really kind of spent a bit of time between uh, field work throughout the Cape Floristic region, but also then looking at them a bit more closely in um, controlled environments. And um, I think there's a lot of questions that we can answer about plant adaptations when we combine these different approaches. So I'm going to stop there with my background um, because today is really more about a year of action and Botsox ongoing conservation footprint. So what I'd like to do is just to set the scene for um, the lineup of webinars that we have, but also for the conserva conservation work that we're doing at the Botanical Society. So we are currently in the process of revising our conservation strategy or footprint, if you want to say it a little bit differently. Um, and some of our focus areas are highlighted here in the slides. But we kind of living in a very interesting time and uh, we believe that with at least in my opinion it's a time where we need to think a little bit broader and um, perhaps take a global view as well so for instance last year I, I believe was the hottest year on record for human civilization at least that we have data for um, and climate change is really here to stay with us for the foreseeable future um, it impacts our biodiversity, ecosystems, and um, most importantly, also our human livelihoods. 
And so we'd really like our conservation footprint to um, take a more or be more holistic so that we can have uh, action driven responses and also think a bit more transdisciplinary in how we actually apply our minds to address um, environmental problems. So this is just in a summary, um, the Botsok Conservation Portfolio. We have six conservation focus areas. We unfortunately don't have time to speak about all six of them today, um, but our three guest speakers, Isabel, Richard, and also Unisia will be touching on the three conservation focus areas highlighted in bold. So in the first lineup, we will have Isabel Johnson as the Botsok Conservation Stewardship Coordinator speaking to biodiversity stewardship. Um, Isabel brings with a wealth of, of experience in this space and she will break it down for us a little bit more. Perhaps some of us are not too familiar with what stewardship means. Um, but this is especially applied in KwaZulu-Natal, um, and there's some great work that Isabel will be speaking to. Then we will have Richard Hay. Richard is our conservation coordinator in uh, Gauteng, or the northern region. Uh, Richard is a, a plantsman, and he has many interests, especially uh, food crops, indigenous food crops, um, as many of you may have seen in our November webinar last year. Um, and Richard will also showcase some of the projects that he is working on at the moment. And then our third speaker will be Unisia Situ. Um, Unisia has an exciting position based between the um, PRU program in KwaZulu Natal or the summer rainfall region. And she also works on national conservation projects with the national office. Um, Unisia started quite recently, so in January, um, but we Really looking forward to have her working in this area, and we're excited for her as well. So without further ado, um, I think we'll listen to Isabel, and then we'll take it from there. Um, good evening, everybody, and thank you for attending this webinar about Botsock's conservation work. Um, I'm Isabel Johnson, and here are some pictures of me in the field doing what I love most, finding exciting plant species in biodiversity stewardship sites. So just to give you a bit of background, um, KZN has really important floristic significance. Um, we've got three existing centers of endemism in Pondo land, down in the south, in Maputa land, which goes over into Mozambique. Um, obviously the Drakensberg Mountain Center and very recently, Dr. Clinton Corbett, who is the Ezemvelo KZN wildlife botanist, has published a paper delineating and describing the Greater Midlands Center, um, which is a very important center of plant endemism. These are just some of the special plants that occur in this, in this center. So it's got well over 200 endemic plant species. And of these 60% are read listed by Sandbees being either threatened or rare. Um, so a couple of examples. There's the pretty well-known in KZN Hilton Daisy, Gerbera orantiaca, which I've done quite a lot of research on over the past several years. Um, there's Asclepia spicuspis, a critically endangered milkweed in the Apocynaceae, which is only known currently from two sites. Um, the very cheerful Senecio exuberans, a KZN misspelt sandstone endemic, and the recently described after one of our colleagues, Neil Crouch, Alo Neil Crouchii, um, which is only found in the Midlands. But sadly, most of, South of KZN's remaining natural areas are under considerable threat from development, urban sprawl, increasing agricultural demand, commercial forestry and overgrazing, like everywhere else in the country, probably. Um, and this map shows just how much of our Midlands mistbelt grassland has been modified or transformed. So on the left, the green areas are the original extent of the mistbelt grassland. And on the right, the red areas show just how much of it 
has been modified and how little remains. So it's no wonder that so many of the species in this area are red listed as threatened. And so what are we doing about it? Well, the one strategy which I'm very involved with and which I'd just like to give you some background to now is the Biodiversity Stewardship Program in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, and I hope I'm not boring people who know something about it, but I'm sure there's some people listening who don't really know what stewardship is. So basically, the program interacts with the custodians of land with high biodiversity value, and we encourage them to declare their properties as stewardship sites. If they, these landowners are willing, we, together with a team of experts, assess the site. And in fact, that's where I've been today. We've been assessing a site in Zululand, um, which is a very nice site with quite a lot of game on it, very nice um, indigenous sand forest. And we've just been through the whole assessment sheet with them, just finished about 10 minutes ago. Um, and if the, if the properties have high biodiversity value, and if the properties are then approved by the Biodiversity Stewardship Working Group, which meets every couple of months, the legal declaration process is started um, for the property to become either a nature reserve or a protected area, which has got legal formal status. Once the property has been declared, the very important process of post-declaration support begins, and this monitors and guides the management of the biodiversity on the sites. So a panel of people who are experts in grassland condition and um, threatened species and animals will meet with the farmer or the community or whoever owns the land or manages the land and discuss what has been achieved in the in the previous year and what needs to be achieved in the coming year. So here is a map of all of the protected areas in KwaZulu-Natal. The dark green areas are the um, Natal is in Velo cases in wildlife reserves. Um, and the yellow areas are the declared biodiversity stewardship sites, which, as you can see, are spread right across Natal, particularly large ones in northern Zululand and little fragmented ones in the misspelt grassland areas and the Stansone South Up, because those are the only areas that remain in a good natural condition. Um, the red circles show the areas where the sites that Botsok has are situated, the Botsok has declared and is currently giving post-proclamation support to. And as you can see, there's one up in northern Zululand, one in the misbelt grassland, um, one near the coast in the sandstone sawfelt, and another one right down at the bottom of Natal on the border with the Eastern Cape. These are just some scenes of some of the sites um, that we have are involved with. This is Bos Boschberg Nature Reserve in the Midlands Misbelt area. Its vegetation is primarily Moy River Highland grassland. It's got Eastern Misbelt forest. It's got cliffs. It's got extensive wetlands with wattled cranes, which are highly endangered. Um, and here is one of the species that occurs on the property, the winter flowering morea, which is a very cheerful little flower that comes up in the middle of winter. Um, this is in Guahumbi Nature Reserve, which is on critically endangered sandstone starfelt, most of which has been transformed for sugarcane or urban development um, and really fantastic landowners on the site. And here's the little beautiful little Brachystelma modestum, which grows in the sandstone and is near threatened. So these little Brachystelmas are only found in the sandstone sawfelt, on usually on or near these sandstone cliffs. Um, 
And this is the Southern Natal Coastal um, Nature Reserve, Red Desert Nature Reserve. Again, a very threatened um, vegetation type, critically endangered Ponderland Ugu sandstone sawfault. It's a mosaic of bush clumps and grassland. Um, it has a lot of Ponderland endemic plants on it, including Phylica natalensis, um, which is pictured here, which is um, categorized as vulnerable. So the, this just showcases some of the uh, of the nature stewardship nature reserves that we are currently working with. So just to summarize what Botsock is doing in the biodiversity stewardship program in KwaZulu Natal, what's really important is that Botsock is the only volunteer based organization that focuses on plant conservation. So it's quite critical that we are involved. So in addition to the nature reserves that we've declared and are supporting, we work very closely with SMV located in wildlife and the other NGOs, especially bird life and conservation outcomes. And we provide botanical information and advice for stewardship sites. Um, and together with Crew and INAT, we're currently planning to compile much more comprehensive species in inventories for the sites. So, yeah, these are just some of the partners that we work with. We are also, as Botsok, very involved in grassland management um, of not only our own, but other organizations' um, stewardship sites. So we carry out regular felt condition assessments and we also do forb diversity. Forbs are the non-grass flowering plants, um, which give us a very it gives us a very good idea of how well the biodiversity is doing in terms of plants and whether we need to change the management of these grasslands. We also do annual pre-burn inspections to see which areas need to be burnt. And in addition, we will give advice on grazing if this is relevant. Um, this is one of the specials that I found recently when we were doing a site assessment up in northern Zululand. Um, this very beautiful Gladiolus scabridus, which only occurs on Itala quartzite. And this is a new locality record for the species. Um, on this proposed biodiversity stewardship site, it hasn't yet been declared, but it is well into the process. And finally, I'd just say like to say thanks to all of our partners um, who we work very closely with, as I said earlier. So the Department of Agriculture, um, KZN Wildlife, WWF Green Trust, BirdLife, Conservation Outcomes, EWT, and particularly Crew, who um, you're going to hear more about from Unisia a bit later on. And thanks to everybody for listening. Thanks, Isabel. I think that provides a really nice introduction to biodiversity stewardship. And thanks especially to you also for the important work that you're doing. Um, it's nice also to see such a partnership uh, project. These projects are, you know, complex, take a lot of time, as you've explained, um, but we, we're really excited as an organization to be present in that space. And our next speaker will be Richard Hay. So Richard is the conservation coordinator working in the Gauteng region. Thanks, Richard. Hi, everyone. So as Martina said, I'm Richard. I'm based in Gauteng. Um, on top of my work for Botsok, I am also the uh, curator of the Future Africa Indigenous and Orphans Crop Collection here at the University of Pretoria. Um, so my interests are very much around edible and medicinal plants. Um, the curcubits that I'm holding in this picture are Nara, a crop from the Narmuk Desert. And this picture was taken last week. Uh, but my interests have expanded looking at people's relationship uh, with plants and how we interact with them as a society. So a lot of the, the projects that I'm working on here in Gauteng are not just about, about the plants themselves, but also about um, 
people's relationships and attitudes towards um, plants specifically, but biodiversity as a whole. So the first project I'm going to be talking about is our Allo Pegrelet reintroduction project. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Allo Pegrelet is a critically endangered range restricted Allo, uh, indigenous to largely the Mahalisberg with a smaller population on the Vidvatus run um, here in Gauteng. They occur in these incredibly shallow, gravelly quartzitic soils um, on fairly rocky north facing slopes. Uh, in 2004, when the last uh, population estimates were done, there were only approximately 70,000 mature individuals left, um, a very niche habitat that they occupy. And the major threat to the species is extraction of mature plants for the horticultural trade. Um, going back to this picture, you'll see they have an incredibly beautiful inflorescence. Um, unfortunately, these plants do not do well in cultivation because of the very specific requirements they have uh, largely to, to dry hot conditions. Uh, so working with our friends at the Allo Farm, we have started a reintroduction program. Um, so Andy DeVette and Quinton Bean out at the Allo Farm in the Park uh, collected seed off of the population on their farm. They then propagated the seed um, for their own introduction project, working with local farmers. Um, along the Michalisberg, and they offered us around 10,000 seedlings um, that we then brought in volunteers who potted them up into seedling trays. Uh, and these seedlings are now housed at the Marnie van der Schiff Botanical Garden here at the University of Pretoria, uh, growing out until next summer, where we will start introducing them onto the Mamalodi side of the Michalisberg. Uh, we work with a traditional healer out there, Dr. Mabena, who has basically dedicated his life to protecting that section of the mountain and maintaining ecosystem integrity out there. Um, he's done a lot of work protecting the remaining vegetation um, from extraction, as well as setting up an indigenous plant nursery uh, on the mountain to provide material to local communities and to researchers. Uh, this area historically has had aloe pegule, but they haven't been recorded there for a few decades. Um, so there is no chance of any possible genetic contamination bringing in an outside population, although um, early genetics work shows that none of the populations on the Michalisberg are distinct enough for that to be a threat anyway. Um, but so these seedlings are sitting with us here. They have grown significantly um, since this picture was taken, uh, thanks to the good rains we've had over summer. They will go through a... Um, a stress phase over winter just to toughen them up a bit and then hopefully beginning of uh, December we will select the biggest ones and then take volunteers to plant these out in the Michalisberg. And this is just a shot of our volunteers who dedicated an entire Saturday planting out um, is it approximately 10,000 seedlings into trays so a tremendous effort from our volunteers here in Kauteng. One of the other projects we're working on is information pamphlets. So I developed these. Uh, this one is the first one we child, the invasive species of Gauteng. Um, it was included in the last box of Buzz. Uh, the idea here is to create freely available resources for people to help identify plants, um, in this case, our problem plants, and assist with uh, alien vegetation hacks and the removal of um, these encroaching species. And then our flagship project at the moment is something I'm very proud of. It's our Constitution Hill Biodiversity Garden. Uh, the idea here is that Gauteng being largely or almost entirely one contiguous urban mass, a lot of um, our urban population struggle to relate to biodiversity. Um, or there's not a lot of information about South Africa's botanical heritage and wealth. Um, and so we were involved with the project uh, with artists at Constitution Hill, which I'll talk about now. But for those of you that don't know, Constitution Hill is located in the center of Johannesburg um, in Hilbra. It was historically a fort that was then turned into a prison complex during the apartheid regime and now houses our constitutional court. And they're currently building the new offices of the Chief Justice. Um, so as I mentioned in Gauteng, one of the biggest struggles we have is how do most people relate to biodiversity. Obviously, we are still grappling with the effects of apartheid architecture. We live in an incredibly uh, complex society with a violent history, both 
academically and within uh, wider society. Uh, not everyone enjoys the same access to green spaces uh, due to this legacy and prevailing socioeconomic conditions. And so as Bots of Katang, we, we're really trying to, to grapple with how to make biodiversity accessible to all South Africans. Uh, Constitution Hill is a living museum grappling with our past um, and looking forward to the future. Uh, and so the idea of this biodiversity garden was born out of an earlier project that I was involved in, uh, talking to artists who were commissioned to paint a mural at, two murals actually, at Constitution Hill, where we brought in a number of indigenous species, talked about uh, South Africa's biodiversity and the importance that it holds uh, to us as botanists and the potential this has for socioeconomic transformation. And so this is just a snapshot of one of the murals. Um, this building now houses the, the collective that we are working with, uh, the South African Creative Industries Incubator, SAKI. Um, and then this is the, the mural within Constitution Hill itself at the former women's prison. Um, and the volunteers that you see in front here, all our Botsop volunteers who are part of building this garden. So when we hosted the workshop with these artists, uh, we did a tour of Constitution Hill, and this garden lies at the center of the former women's prison. It was the wardenesses uh, personal garden within the prison complex, but it was also used uh, for briefings and intakes of inmates uh, while the prison was active. So both a space of tranquility for the wardenesses, but also a site of violence for the inmates. As you can see, before we came in, the garden was fairly bare. There were a couple of agathanthus um, and some cannas, but not much going on there. Um, and then these historical palms uh, were there from, were planted when the prison was still active. So we came in, partnered with a number of uh, different nurseries in Gauteng and planted out at a, a little bit more than 120 species and horticultural hybrids representing all nine of South African biomes uh, to give a sense of the biodiversity, the botanical biodiversity that we have in South Africa, um, geared largely towards the urban population and tourists moving through the space. Obviously, as a historical site, there's a huge tourist flow through this area. And so it was a great opportunity to showcase biodiversity to tourists moving through. Uh, these are all the sponsors that we had with the collaborators on the project. Um, it took a tremendous amount of effort to bring in that number of plants, and we are incredibly grateful to everyone here for their contributions. Um, this garden uh, now has weekly sessions where we go in on the last Saturday of every month to weed and maintain the space, as well as bring in new species. And the idea is that going forward, we'll start hosting talks about the history of horticulture in South Africa, our biodiversity and other topics related um, to the plant and soil sciences. And so if you are in Gauteng and any of these projects grab your fancy, uh, please reach out to us if you are not yet involved, either through our social media at Box of Gauteng, or you can email me directly uh, at Gauteng at botanicalsociety.org.za. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. I think that's a, it's almost a too quick an overview for, you know, lots of exciting projects. Um, thanks for that. And um, you're really good at mobilizing volunteers, among other things. <laughs> so just a great thanks from us. And I'm looking forward to actually visit Richard next week um, to catch up a little bit on, on some of these amazing projects. So we're going to shift to another gear. Um, I'd like to hand over to Unisia Situ. Um, she will be talking about her work with the custodians of rare and endangered wildflowers. Um, it's, of course, one of our botsock supported projects, along with the Mapulba Trust. Um, Unisia has a wealth of experience or academic background in medicinal plants of Mozambique. She's done a lot of groundbreaking work there. Um, Unisia, we're looking forward to having that expertise in the team as well. Um, but thank you. I now hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Martina. Um, thank you everyone for joining in as well. We appreciate that. Um, so I'm just going to get straight to my talk. Um, so as I am joining crew, I am jumping onto a 20 year moving train. Crew recently celebrated their 20th anniversary. So 
you know, it's just something big to jump into. So as Martina has introduced me, I am Eunasia Sitoye, and I hold a master's degree from the University of Johannesburg. My dissertation was on the medicinal plants of Mozambique. We published the first ever inventory of Mozambique medicinal plants in the special issue of in ethnobotany in the Journal of Ethnopharmacology. So I have also recently submitted my PhD thesis, which focused on the medicinal plants of the Tsonga people of South Africa and Mozambique. It was through my academic journey on medicinal plants where I realized my passion for conservation. When my participants shared concerns about the availability of some of their beloved medicinal species, I knew I had to do something about it, which is why working for Botsock and crew was such an amazing opportunity for me to, sh to be actively involved in the conservation and preservation of our wonderful plants for future generations, including being associated with like-minded people here at Botsock. So one of the things highlighted in my thesis is the differences in medicinal plants use between different cultural groups in South Africa. Knowing which culture uses what plants will help in projects such as species recovery, as you have seen also from Richard's um, presentation. So this notion has prompted this pamphlet similar to what you saw on Richard's presentations for the invasives. However, this one highlights commonly traded, traded medicinal plants in Gauteng, KwaZulu Natal, Limpopo, Pumalanga, and the Eastern Cape provinces. The featured, the featured plants are predominantly threatened due to overharvesting. As I said earlier, identifying the specific regions where these plants are most utilized will expedite conservation efforts for, for their protection. So now you have heard me talk about CRU. For those who don't know, CRU stands for the Custodians of Rare and Endangered Wildflowers. It is a citizen science program, meaning we work with members of the public to reach our conservation goals. CRU has three nodes. It started in the Cape Floristic region, then later expanded to the Summer Rainfall region, and then the Eastern Cape. So listed below each node, as, as you can see here, are the different citizen science groups that work with crew. So if you see a group that in your region, why not join? Or if you see, if you think that the region should have its, your region should have its own group, then go ahead and join the crew family. But first, let me share with you what crew does. So the data collected by crew and its volunteers feeds into the National Red, Red List database and iNaturalist. So CRU essentially focuses on plant monitoring, which is divided into these four clusters, as you can see on this slide. So species of conservation concern are those of high conservation importance in terms of preserving South Africa's biodiversity and not only include threatened species, but also those that are classified as extinct in the wild um, endangered, regionally extinct, near threatened, critically rare, declining, and data deficient. So through this work, CRU has discovered about 80 species which are new to science. So in terms of species recovery, this involves the growing and rehabilitation of threatened species, such as the aloe that was shown in Richard's presentation as well. Um, so these are species that are on the verge of extinction due to population decline. This involves plants being grown ex situ. Um, also, the Cape Floristic Region node of CRU is actively involved with this project. Undersampled areas are those whose biodiversity is poorly known. It is important to regularly survey areas in order to monitor and manage changes occurring in that particular area. Moreover, frequent monitoring can also result in noteworthy records. Crew has rediscovered about 70 species which were thought to be extinct. So for the critical habitat species, these are species that are housed in, in areas um, and thus identifying and surveying these areas helps promote stewardship work, ensuring that the areas 
are protected. So now that you know about crew, let me share some of the projects we are excited about in 2024 as the summer rainfall region. So we are targeting about 72 species of conservation concern with our crewites, which those are our volunteers. Thank you to the volunteers who have also attended. Um, we have an, is an initial of seven field trips to target undersampled areas. Other events to combat undersampled areas include BioBlitz with our partners and stakeholders, including the City Nature Challenge and Greater Southern BioBlitz. We're excited to monitor the newly described Seropegia species and our South African Cryptocaria species. It will also be interesting to record our South African endemics during the BioBlitz events, including the City Nature Challenge. Um, we are also looking forward to our annual workshop, which is um, that, that coming weekend, not this one, but the following Saturday. And from the flyer, you can see that we are in for a drill. It's, it's really going to be amazing. So we, as I spoke about the City Nature Challenge, that will be happening on the 26th to the 29th of April. Um, so if you have not joined your city's project on INET, please do so. Uh, if you don't know how to join the project on INET, I'm just going to, pu to put this here. Um, if you are in the Etewini region, you can contact Reshmi to book your space for in-person INET trainings. Uh, even if you're outside the area, I'm not sure how that works, but you can still just contact Reshmi and find out more information and please just join the City Nature Challenge for your city. Um, with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. If you have any questions for me and would like to know more about our project or become part of, of CREW, please feel free to contact me at e.sitoye at sanbi.org.za. Thank you all. Thank you, Eunizia. Always lots of things going on with the crew team, so we're also very excited. And uh, thank you for the wonderful work that you're already doing in your very recent time with the crew program. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, just to alert everyone to, especially to the City Nature Challenge from the 26th to the 29th of April. Um, there will be some communications around that also via our WhatsApp buzz, which we hope you're receiving. Um, if you're not receiving the WhatsApp buzz and you're a member, please um, make contact with National Office. So we generally uh, communicate some of the upcoming um, bio blitz and other events through the WhatsApp buzz. Um, our last presentation for the day, and certainly not the least, um, is by Cherise Fulyun. Um, I forgot to mention that Cherise sent us a pre-recorded presentation. Um, we have a small project that we are collaborating on, and Cherise unfortunately couldn't be here uh, live tonight but she's fortunately supplied us with a pre-recorded presentation. Um, so I'll hand over to that and then we will close the, the webinar. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Lovely to be with you, even if it's not live um, and in person. And really looking forward to uh, the 2024 year of webinars. And it's not just webinars that I'm going to be doing. The Botanical Society have invited me to share my botanical horticultural knowledge in uh, various ways and uh, I'm going to be talking to you today a little bit about the upcoming talks and presentations that we're going to be offering on climate smart gardening. So Dr. Martina Trenicht and I are together offering these talks. They are informative, they are interactive, they're going to be about Botox's conservation work and their projects, also how you can get involved with the Botanical Society and support the Botanical Society, particularly in the future going forward. And from my side, it's the know and the grow, so gardening smart techniques, always encouraging people to use indigenous plants in their gardens and natural methods as much as possible. I'm going to be including all sorts of tips and tricks, just how to tell if a plant is water wise or not with a quick glance, 
definitely recommending perennials that are hardy but also really pretty and if they could have a threatened status so you could be doing your part to help conserve our wonderful flora then those will be included and always soil care soil care when it comes to water wise or climate smart gardening uh, taking care of the soil definitely is the way to take care of your garden I have a variety of slides to show you just to inspire you to start doing wild and wonderful things in the garden. This slide in particular pleases me just with its color tones. It's so beautiful. I'll be recommending plants for if you have a terraced garden, a slope garden, uh, and this garden, as you can see, gets quite a lot of shade. So it's quite an inspiring combination of plants that they've used here. You might have so little garden that all you have is a few crevices in your beautiful rock wall. I will have a few things to recommend. But if you just have an open, sunny space, we have loads of bulbs and perennials that make a beautiful display combined together. From creating potpourri inside the home to creating color displays in your garden, we really are, with some of our perennials, spoilt for choice. And it is important, of course, whether you're taking inspiration from your nursery, to remember that the insects and the wildlife come along with it. So as long as these can still support pollinators, yes, let's do it. Kirsten Watch takes its inspiration from the wild. Look how beautiful this display of just annuals with a couple of uh, geranium and carnums in the front. How stunning it can be when we play with the colours of our natural wild species. So, how do you get Martina and I? How do you get to hear what we want to say to you and share with you? Well, our talks are happening in the Western Cape. It's a PowerPoint presentation, but we really love to engage with the audience. There's no cost and we will bring some tasty treats. I'm always trying to get people to engage with indigenous plants and it's so lovely to show people what they can eat from their garden as well. So we'll bring along a couple of treats um, and you are welcome to contact the Botanical Society head office to book us and ask when can we come and how can you hear us. Thank you so much. Have a lovely evening further. Thank you to Cherise also for that insert. Um, and we're looking forward to have Cherise more involved in our future webinar lineup, uh, sorry, lineups for the year. Um, I'd like to invite our speakers to switch on their cameras. Um, and if there's any questions from the audience, I see there's a couple that came in from, or at least in the chat. Um, from Takondwa. Um, Takondwa, I see you're a student based in Cape Town. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, we're happy to have you here also. I think, um, Takondwa, some of the questions that you are asking are perhaps too, you know, we'd have to go into a lot of detail if we want to answer them uh, thoroughly for you. But um, it relates to alien invasive species, you know, and why are they so common? across South Africa. So there's a whole field of, of research dedicated um, to, to the vectors of alien species. Um, we can probably connect with you afterwards or provide some resources for you if you want to. Um, but I do think uh, perhaps Richard, one of the questions that he is asking is how can individuals promote indigenous plants in local communities? And I think that speaks a lot to the work that you've been doing, Richard, and some of the projects that you that you also highlighted. Um, so the biggest thing is personal connections. The easiest way to get people interested in something you're interested in is to find something to bond over. Um, I find it's really easy with edible and medicinal plants. I think a lot of humanity is intertwined with food. Um, so that's always my go-to, even when we're discussing um, non-edibles to try and find some common ground first. Um, I think the the best way to to promote a particular pl 
planting and projects within your community is to find one or two like-minded people and just get going. Don't try to build up a large group first. Um, I think a lot of people get caught up in trying to build too big of a following before starting projects. We found if there's one or two of you who have the energy and are willing to get into your community and start talking about plants, promoting plants, and just planting plants, uh, people will come. It, they jump on board. And so at Constitution Hill, at one of our last plantings, there was an art gallery um, opening at the same time. And people attending the art gallery who were not in any way related to Botsock saw us working in the garden, thought it looked cool, and just started climbing into the garden to assist with the weeding um, in their fancy attire. So I think that really speaks to society's interest in doing novel things. And if you can be the person pioneering plants in your community, don't hesitate to be that person. Thanks, Richard. I think that covers it um, really well and provides a, a good sort of way forward also for building connections and, and um, reinforcing existing connections to actually expand as well. Um, I don't think we have any other questions, so which means we've covered it pretty well, perhaps, <laughs> possibly. Um, I'm going to formally thank Unisia, Isabel and Richard. Um, and then I just have one more little slide that I would like to show as a closing. Thank you so much for all three of you. So from my side, um, looking forward also for the lineup of the year, um, we'd really like to thank our national conservation team. We hope you are excited about the work that was presented today. We hope it will inspire you to get involved and also volunteer on some of the projects. Um, there's exciting things happening in the Botox space um, that we keep sharing with you during the course of the year. Our major communication channels, um, as I've mentioned, is the Botox Buzz, which comes out monthly. Um, of course, we also have our Felt and Flora digital hub um, and the printed magazine that still comes out in June every year. Um, and we just would like to keep engaging with you. Don't hesitate to contact us. Um, if you have any conservation questions, you can send them to the email address below. And um, I'd also like to invite you to look a bit more at the entire or the complete portfolio of conservation work available on our website. Um, and don't forget, our next webinar will be again the last Thursday in March, so the th 28th of March. Um, I do believe it's school holiday, but um, perhaps you can still join us, uh, even if you're in a relaxed environment or going away for the holiday period. So that's all, folks, for tonight. Have a good evening, and we'll be seeing you hopefully next month.